Good evening. I'm Penny Pillsbury. I'm the director of the Brown Owl Library. Welcome, welcome to our uh, first Wednesday in uh, March. Uh, to, uh, tonight we have Jay Perini, who's a uh, professor of English and creative writing at uh, Middlebury College. He's done it for over 30 years, teaching courses on poetry and fiction, and most recently on poetry and spirituality. Uh, he's, he's a poet, a novelist, biographer, and critic. He has five books of poetry. Okay, well, thank you for coming tonight. Um, Art of Subtraction. And I, I hope I can say something of interest to you about historical fiction. Benjamin's um, Crossing. It's a very strange genre, of historical Canada. fiction. The and, last uh, station, I like working in it, I like reading it, I like thinking about it. Um, and I like working in biography. And recently there's been a lot of of novels that have had uh, been crossovers between historical fiction and biography. Uh, that's a genre that I tend to, that I uh, accidentally wandered into with my book on Leo Tolstoy. A life of Jesus. Have any of you read my book on Jesus, Leo Tolstoy? The human face of God. Okay, so most of you haven't. You're lucky, there's a few copies here. <laughs> How have you not read one of the great American novels? I'm stunned. And I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for all of you. Okay, um, but I wandered into this accidentally. Um, in, 19, in the late 80s, I was living in Italy. Of course, the Vermont Humanities Council. <laughs> we have, we have uh, local sponsors of the Brown Owl Library Foundation, okay. the Friends of Brown Owl Library, was, was IBM, in the, in the, and Colford Overton and Wilson TC. Um, uh, title of the talk uh, tonight actually, is Actually, my son Oliver, Oliver who's sitting in the back there with his girlfriend Elsie, who edits the news, local newspaper, Welcome to was uh, when we arrived in Italy in 1985 or so, it was 86, he was uh, three weeks old. And uh, it was quite a time living there. And um, I began, and it turned out our next door neighbor was Gore Vidal. Oh, wow. <laughs> By sheer chance, Gore Vidal was our next door neighbor. And so he lived, it, actually he lived just above us. Uh, there was this great palazzo uh, up, up above us on a cliff uh, on five stories. And Gore lived up there like a Roman emperor, emperor in exile. <laughs> You guys can come in. Come on in before we start. Spaces. Spaces. There's a seat right there. Hey. hey. Okay, I'm gonna hold this uh, like Frank Sinatra in a nightclub. Okay, I'll hold on to this. This is probably go in and out. Is that working? Yeah. yeah okay. So, uh, uh, where was I? Gore Vidal's looking up at the hilltop, and uh, I started reading his because we became good friends. I started reading his novel Lincoln which had recently come out and was a huge success. And I thought, hmm. And my conversations with Gore went every single day. He would arrive like clockwork at 4 o'clock at our little house in Atrani, which is next to Amalfi. He would knock on my door, and he would take me down to the village, to the, to the piazza, where we would have a glass of wine. 
and sometimes we'd stay until three in the morning. And uh, over many glasses of wine, we would discuss historical fiction and biographical fiction. And, uh, and I was reading a Tolstoy at the moment. Um, I, would sit, I would get up at every morning at, at 5 a.m. as the sun would come up, and I would sit up on the somewhat icy um, terrazzo of our villa, little villa, <laughs> overlooking the sea, the Mediterranean, and I would, uh, I would, you know, Oliver, three, four months old, weeks old, five weeks old, six weeks old, two months old, five months old, I would rock him in his little thing there, right? That, and I was reading War and Peace. I read War and Peace, rocking Oliver. And then I would read uh, Anna Karenina, and I would rock Oliver. And then I would read, um, you know, uh, on and on, through Tolstoy. <coughs> and one day I wandered up into uh, Na Naples with Oliver in a backpack, and, um, I went into a used bookstore, and there was a biography, there was a, a memoir by Valentin Bulgakov, who had been Tolstoy's secretary. He was a 26-year-old University of, of Moscow dropout who became Tolstoy's secretary in his last year. And uh, he wrote an amazing diary of what it, life was like with the Tolstoys. And it was terrifically awful, you know. <laughs> uh, Tolstoy was, was, was a madman. You know, and he, you know, he lived in this, you know, uh, you know, t fifteen thousand acre estate, an ancestral estate with thirty five personal servants, and uh, you know, he had he had disciples all around him. People would come. This press would come to his door every day and worship, uh, wanting to see catch a glimpse of the great man. His wife Sophia and her thirteen children were always, you know, tugging at him one way or another, and uh, you know, he believed passionately in um, the principles that he was advocating, which were, well, where he believed in poverty and chastity, which, which were, you know, and, and you know, here he has 13 children, and he's living, you know, 35 personal servants. He has a personal medical doctor who's with him 24-7. And uh, so he, it was difficult. He, let's say that he was not good at either poverty or chastity, <laughs> but he believed in them. And so it struck me as, wow, what a situation. And I read in this um, diary that, uh, that Bulgakov said, um, everybody living around Tolstoy, his children, his wife, his servants, his doctor, his publisher who was living nearby, uh, everybody was keeping a diary of day by day at Tolstoy's house, which was called Yasnaya Polyanya. And I thought, wow, I, I've got to read these diaries. And I wrote to the Tolstoy Society in London. And they said, oh, we can get you all these diaries. They're all translated. And I wrote, read a little bit of Russian. I'd studied some Russian in Scotland at the University of St. Andrews, where I did my PhD. And um, <coughs> so I began reading all of these diaries of, of Tolstoy's uh, clan, the people around him. And it was quite a thing to see these. It was, it was uh, like Rashomon, you know, the, the, the story unfolding from many, many viewpoints. And uh, just one morning I woke up, and I, I was going to make a, I thought this would make a great book a kind of history of Tolstoy's last year. But then I started writing it from the point of view of the various people. I'd write a little bit as Sophia's uh, lesbian daughter, Sasha. I'd write a little bit as his publisher, Ch Vladimir Chertkov. I'd write a little bit as Sophia. I wrote very well as Sophia. I liked being Tolstoy's wife. Uh, I, I was good at, I, I liked different voices and I got into them all. And so I created over a period of two years or three years, this kind of, this novel, which you can buy, of many layers of voices uh, and um, telling the story of Tolstoy's last year, focused on, you know, Russia, the whole of Tolstoy's life is, is, is filtered through this lens of his final year. And quite a year it was. And so it did, you know, made a very, if you've seen the film, it made a very exciting film with Christopher Plummer as Tolstoy and Sir Helen Mirren as uh, Mrs. Tolstoy. And uh, the young, um, Secretary Valentin Bulgakov was played by James McAvoy, who's a very gifted actor, and Paul Giamatti played his horrendous publisher, uh, Chertkov. So it was kind of it made an interesting film, and um, it got me thinking about biographical fiction, which is more what I've done than say historical fiction. Uh, I had done before that um, an historical novel set in. Come on in, find a seat. Uh, I'd written a novel set in the coal mining country of Pens Pennsylvania in um, 1925. So I suppose that was an historical novel. That's called The Patch Boys. Um, so, um, 
But in the mid-90s after Tolstoy, I started to hover between writing for a period between writing biographical novels slash biographical slash historical novels and writing straight biographies. You know, at first I did, I'd been working on Robert Frost since I first became uh, a teacher in 1975. My first job after seven years in Scotland at the University of St. Andrews was assistant professor at Dartmouth. And I remember coming to Dartmouth and getting there in 1975, the summer, and wondering what the hell I was going to do with myself. Uh, so uh, I walked into the rare books room of the library, the Baker Library, and I said, anything interesting in here? <laughs> And they said, well, we've got all the papers mostly of Robert Frost. I said, wow, that looks interesting. And I sat down to read. And they would bring me box loads of Frost's letters, letters of his wife Eleanor, letters of his friends. And I had always adored Robert Frost's poetry. I had it practically by heart. And um, I began interviewing friends of Frost's who lived in the area. Uh, John Sloan Dickey, who'd been president of Dartmouth, lived down the road from me. And I used to spend a lot of time with him. And so. I got to know a lot of Frost's friends and, and gathered all these conversations together. And so I, I was working on the biography of Frost when someone asked me to write a biography of John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck's widow called me one day. She had read my book on Tolstoy and she said, I, I love your book on Tolstoy and I wonder if you'd write a biography of John. I said, John who? John Steinbeck. And I said, oh. I said, you're Mrs. Steinbeck, yes. So I. I started working with Elaine Steinbeck and, and in a very, very short order because there was a kind of urgency uh, for publishing reasons. I wrote this, bio this massive biography of John Steinbeck. It was one of those books that should have been published with little wheels and a retractable handle. <coughs> you know, if it fell on you while you were reading in bed, it would have crushed your chest, <laughs> broken your ribs. It was about a thousand pages in TypeScript. And, um, but that got me going on writing a biography, and I learned sort of a little bit how to do it. And that helped me with my frost. So then I went back at the frost. Meanwhile, I took a detour into Walter Benjamin, who was a great uh, fan. Uh, I was a great fiend of his. I loved his work. I, lo I read him fiendishly, I mean, in the 60s. He was a great intellectual. Um, grew up in Berlin in the 20s, uh, or actually before that, in the First World War era. And then lived in Paris in in the tw in the moved to Paris in what 1920, and he lived there in the 20s and 30s, um, and then uh, was working on his wonderful essays and books. He was a scholar, literary critic, art historian, uh, sometimes short story writer, um, a great mind, one of the great uh, founding fathers of modern criticism. And he was chased by the Nazis out of Paris in 1940, and he escaped over the Pyrenees only to be captured by the Nazis in, 19, in uh, he was taken over the, over the Pyrenees by a woman called Lisa Fitko, who had rescued over 2,000 Jews in World War II. Amazing woman, and um, when he was caught, uh, caught, just as he got over the border, he committed suicide rather than go back. So it's a hell of a story, um, uh, the story of Walter Benjamin. He was carrying with him his 1,000-page manuscript, which he'd been working on for 20 years in Paris. And uh, when he was uh, killed, uh, he, that manuscript was lost and it's never been found. So it's quite a story, um, the story of Walter Benjamin. So I wrote, uh, uh, so what happened was I was actually in Europe and I saw in the newspaper an interview with Lisa Fitko. I thought, wow, she, she's still alive? This was about 1992. And I immediately rushed to meet her. And uh, she was living in a nursing home and she was about 96. And she remembered vividly taking Walter Benjamin over the Pyrenees into Spain. And uh, she said, you know, I took 2,000 people over the Pyrenees during World War II. And everybody that ever comes in here, and she said, it's not many, they always ask me about this guy. Who was he? <laughs> I said, well, he was a major literary critic and an intellectual. So uh, she told me the amazing detail, image by image story of taking Benjamin, she said he, he arrived to go over the Pyrenees dressed in his city shoes. He had a suit on, a jacket and tie. And all the way climbing the mountains over the Pyrenees into Spain, he refused to take off his tie. So, you know, quite a character. You know, really he was born for the city streets of Berlin or London or Paris, you know. So he was deeply uncomfortable being in, um, 
going over the mountains, and it was, it's, it's a story. So I, I wrote that novel uh, in the mid-90s. It's called Benjamin's Crossing, and we've just now finished the script of it, and it's going to be made into a film starring Stanley Tucci as Walter Benjamin. So, um, so um, then after that, I, I was thinking historical fiction. I did take a little byway, in fact, um, after Benjamin. I always forget that I did this. But there is this strange book of mine, this one here, a very odd novel. It's 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 it's, it's truly terrible book. Um, <laughs> and there's a couple of copies there if you'd like to read it. <laughs> it's about it goes back and forth between a guy who's a professor at a place like Middlebury College, who's writing a book about Columbus and Columbus himself in 1492, invading the Dominican Republic. And it was kind of, I would say it's more of an hallucination of mine than an actual book. I used to, for a period there, I would spend a lot of time in uh, the Dominican Republic uh, because one of my best friends, my mentor from Scotland, from St. Andrews, was a New Yorker writer called Alastair Reed who um, had, he bought a 15-acre uh, beach in, the, in a very remote part of uh, the, the Dominican Republic. And he lived there like Robinson Crusoe. You know, he, had a, he built this hut, which was really a hut, and uh, he, would, he had no electricity, no running water. Uh, any food he ate was a fish he would catch in the local sea, which was incredible. In fact, he, it's interesting about his fish because Alistair um, used to get his mail once a month. It would come into him in a big pile. And he had a, a guy that worked for him uh, called Jose, and Jose would go through the catalogs that would come, and there was one that had a, a, an exercise machine, and he said, what is this, Alistair? So that's called an exercise machine, a rowing machine, and he said, raw machine that rows. He said, this is the worst part of my life, rowing. Please get me this machine. <laughs> and Alistair said, no, no, it sits in your living room. You go nowhere, you just row. He couldn't understand that at all. <laughs> Alistair said, it's for exercise. He said, what is this thing? Exercise. Couldn't understand it. But uh, then he found this kind of uh, special harpoon. And he told Alistair if he got him this harpoon, he would supply him with fresh fish for life. So every day, the catch would come. And so it was kind of amazing. Every th Alistair had a, an amazing garden. You know, anything you would drop in the ground, like a bamboo stick, it would become a tree in five minutes. You know, everything grew. He had all this fresh fish. So we went down many times, Oliver and his kids, his brothers and my wife, and we would stay in this incredible hut uh, by the beach. And, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. And I, so that's all in that novel, Bay of Arrows, which is the bay where Columbus in 1492 first arrived. It was the actual bay. They figured it out, and, and of course, he, he immediately set about killing all of the Indians and so forth. It's a terrible story of genocide and, and, and disease and everything else, so uh, that's all in that novel, Bay of Arrows, which, as I say, I keep forgetting I actually wrote. But um, then um, in the late 90s, then I finally moved toward publishing my biography of Robert Frost uh, in 19, uh, 2000, came out, 1999. And that was 25 years off and on of fiddling with that damn book. Uh, but uh, I love Frost and still do. And, uh, uh, you know, I talked to everybody who was alive who had known Frost. And I met endless. And it, what, what's really sad is how many people you meet after the fact who say, oh, I wish I'd met you because I have a wonderful story. Everybody has a wonderful story about Frost. Probably half of you in here have wonderful stories about Frost. This woman just came up to me and she said, oh, I have a great story about Robert Frost. I said, oh, no. <laughs> She said, um, she said she went as a student at Middlebury and she graduated in 1954. And she went up to the Bread Loaf Writers Conference that year. And Frost, as always, ended the conference with her, his own reading, right? In the little theater, if you've been up there. And he always ended with fire and ice. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also fine and would suffice. <laughs> and she said he ended, and then he walked out through the west doors and went down to the lawn and started smoking and looking up at the stars. <laughs> and there was thunderous applause, but he was ignoring it. And she said she followed him down. 
She went up to him nervously. She said, Mr. Frost, may I have a word with you? He said, what do you want? She said, Mr. Frost, I have just one question. Well, what is your question, lady? She said, Mr. Frost, what did you mean by that poem, Fire and Ice? And he said, what did I mean? I meant this. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say, <laughs> recite the whole damn poem. He was an ornery son of a bitch, Robert Frost. I mean, he really was bad. <laughs> but he was a truly great poet, right? So to me, it was a thrill to work on him. And I always love going around the country or the world, really, uh, and talking about Robert Frost, because I always feel like I, I am, when I do that, I am Robert Frost. I channel Robert Frost, you know? <laughs> I, and uh, you know, sometimes my wife will say to me, you've got to remember, you are not Robert Frost. <laughs> you just think you're Robert Frost. This is some kind of fo folie a deux, you know? <laughs> so, but I love uh, talking about Frost and reciting his poems by memory. Uh, when I teach Frost at Middlebury, I always say all of his poems by memory. And the students are so amazed that you can remember the poems. I mean, Frost was once act w asked, why uh, can you remember all these poems? How do you remember all these poems of yours? And he said, if they won't stick to me, I won't stick to them. <laughs> he had a a wonderful way of saying things, right? Uh, he's got that wonderful aphoristic quality at the end of his poem. Good fences make good neighbors, right? So it's the great stuff. But then I went on to, um, after that, to, to my friend Herman Melville here. This is, this is the book called The Passages of H.M. H.M. is Herman Melville. And I was always interested in Mr. Melville, author of Moby Dick, Billy Budd, and so forth. Um, and I wrote that novel, part, part of it I, I wrote, it's in two bits. It alternates chapters. One stream of narrative is written like a straight biography. Only I always imagined, what if a biographer really knew everything that happened? Only a novelist can do that. That's the dare in fiction, right? So I said, let's just pretend I am God as novelist. And I really know what he's desiring, what he's thinking, and what's happening to him. And be free of scholarship. You know, writing about Frost, Steinbeck, or William Faulkner, another guy I wrote his biography, you're kind of stuck because, you know, I am a professor and a scholar. So if you're going to call a, a book about William Faulkner a biography, Robert Frost a biography, you're kind of stuck with the footnotes, really quoting the letters, really you know, you can't really go too deep. You can go only as deep as you can go with writing history. And biography is simply a form of history, right? So, but in a novel, you can make things up. You can use the mind as a kind of a flashlight to penetrate into the darker corners of the mind or history. And it gives you a freedom and it gives you a kind of a giddiness, right? So, in, uh, so one big strand of my Melville novel is me as God writing Melville as though I really know what he was wishing and thinking. But you know, I know an awful lot about Herman Melville, so it was kind of fun to say, okay, think of his life. I mean, here's a guy who, who goes off to sea for his university. He said the whaling boat was his Harvard and his Yale. He goes sailing off as a young man of 18, 19, 20 to the, he had already been on some journeys just to Europe and back, he goes off to the South Seas, and he jumps ship, the ship in the Marquesas. And he and his friend Toby Green were captured by a tribe of bisexual cannibals. Just think of that. How many of us are ever going to get captured by a tribe of bisexual cannibals? So it was kind of fun to write that stuff. <laughs> Let your imagination run free. Because, you know, the biographers simply say, in, you know, 1849, Herman Melville was captured by a tribe of, uh, a rare tribe of bisexual cannibals. But that's it. You know, what? <laughs> what happened? Who knows? You know, he's there for months. What happened? So I tell you in the book. <laughs> but remember, I made all that shit up. <laughs> And, 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 the <laughs> and um, I I'll tell the story alternately by Elizabeth Shaw Melville. 
Her father was um, Supreme Court Justice of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She was from a very upper class family, as was Melville from a very fancy family, right? Uh, his family were Gansevoorts. There's a Gansevoort Street in Manhattan. Um, Melville was from a very upper class family. Um, <coughs> but Lizzie, his wife, uh, was an amazing woman, as far as I can tell. Only three or four letters of her exist, and I hear that really incredible catty voice of hers, and I think, wow, what a person. Imagine being married to Herman Melville. And, uh, and uh, so, that, but you know, there's so, it's so killing that there really is no record of her except for these three letters. And you know, and, and Melville in his diary saying, how did I ever marry this woman? She's crazy, but he stayed with her for 50 years. So she couldn't have been that crazy. And um, so I tried to imagine Lizzie Melville and what it was like. At one point, she wrote to her brother uh, in Boston, who was a lawyer, and she said, I can't stand him anymore. She said, hire some um, kidnappers in Boston. Have them come to New York City, and for God's sake, have them kidnap me to get me away from Herman. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he wrote back and said, dear Elizabeth, that's rather an elaborate way to leave your husband. Uh, do, you, do we really need the kidnappers? <laughs> and then she said, oh, forget about it. So she stayed married to him for another 50 years, or 30 years. So it's quite a story, Elizabeth Mel Lizzie Melville. Uh, you know, an incredible story. So I have the whole story of his whaling adventures, writing Moby Dick, uh, his, his friendship, which sl slash, well, love affair, not sexual, but I would say um, emotional, with uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is quite a story. In fact, the greatest literary friendship of American literature, apart from, let's say, Emerson and Thoreau, would be Hawthorne and Melville, really more passionate even, obviously, than, um, than, than Thoreau and, Hoth and Emerson. <coughs> so so that, was that, that, that book was fun to work on. Um, so um, historical fiction is just one of those things that, um, you know, uh, in many ways I don't think of it as historical fiction. I think it's a, a bullshit category, okay? Bullshit category. No such thing really as historical fiction. There's novels and there's fiction, and there's not novels, right? There's fiction and there's nonfiction. What is fiction? It's from the Latin word fictio or fingere, which simply means to shape. And you shape factual material. You give it a form. Uh, I, would, I, I was interested once when I went into an Israeli bookstore. I said, where's your fiction section? And the, librarian, uh, the bookstore owner said, oh, in, is, in Hebrew, we don't have a distinction between uh, novels, fiction, and narratives of history, which are also stories. We call it, the word is siporet, right? So yeah, I like that idea that there should not be, in many ways, there's no distinction. There's two different, there's books of fact and there's books of fiction. And if you're telling a story, the Greek word for story is mythos, then you're involved in fiction. You're shaping, you're repressing certain events. Even, you know, uh, you write a biography of, of Frost or Winston Churchill or John Kennedy, you're suppressing certain things, you're highlighting other things, that's fiction. You're giving a narrative. Lives don't, lives don't normally have a narrative. We don't have a narrative arc. Yeah, we're born and we die, but there's no plot, not much of one. So fiction, I mean, in, even in history, you're giving a plot, you know? Historians, I say, are, I, I drove, I was uh, giving a talk at the University of Minnesota two or three months ago, and I think I gave some professor of history a heart attack because he stood up and started screaming at me. Um, I said, you know, and then I, he said, I'm an historian, and I object to the idea that um, I would be arranging facts. Uh, and I said, well, I said, oh, I said, you're, I said, face it, you're just a novelist. You're a fiction maker. There's no such thing as history that isn't fiction. It drove him crazy. I, I had such a good argument with him in public. It was great. But I will always win that argument. You know that? Because, uh, you know, I said to him, I quoted Oscar Wilde, I said, the English, he was an Englishman, I said, here he is, He's, I said, the English are always degrading truths into facts. It's <laughs> a great line from The Importance of Being Earnest. I try not to degrade truths into facts. You know, I don't want to be like 
Dickens' character in Hard Times, Mr. Gradgrind, who says, facts, facts, facts. Well, it's bullshit. There are no such facts. There are these little, dead, inert things. And if we arrange them and we make a, a pattern of them, if we make a shape and give them life, then we're making fiction. And we can call it history, or we can call it novel, or we can call it biography. But we're creating stories. Now, the next thing of mine that will come out will be my biography of Jesus Christ. I've, I've, let's just say I've been aiming high. <laughs> um, how do you write? People keep saying to me, how, how do you write a biography of Jesus Christ? I mean, what kind of research do you do? I said, well, I had to, you know, I, I interviewed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <laughs> and that was really difficult. <laughs> I said, Mark, he was so stern. <laughs> Luke, he's a nice guy. Matthew, oh, so so. John, he's a nutcase. <laughs> so I had, I had uh, fun working. I mean, I do think I, it was uh, interesting to, uh, what I say at the beginning of this book is, um, I say, this is, I said, Jesus, the story of Jesus Christ is our great mythos. Mythos is the Greek word for story. And I'm simply interested in this as, as a great story, which has a great deal to teach us about the nature of life and death and so forth. So, um, you know, and I, and I retell the story of Jesus, not really, you know, worrying too much about anything, but what is the story? What is so compelling about this story that over 20 um, centuries, people have been wildly compelled by, by this narrative, and it is a narrative. That's what I'm involved in. Whether I'm writing history or fiction, uh, I'm involved in narrative, right? And so, so that gives you a kind of a broad bird's eye view of the kind of work I have done and some of my thoughts here on the nature of fiction, the nature of truth. Truth is a very difficult thing, right? Uh, Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? Right? But, you know, I think it, as Bill Clinton said when he was being interviewed about Monica Lewinsky, depends on what you mean by is. <laughs> right? Truth is a very difficult thing to come at, and uh, we come at it via different ways, right? And I, I think that fiction and story making, narrative, are ways of getting at um, things that interest us and, and seeing the shape in shapes in reality. And that's what I'm trying to do in these uh, various books of mine. So you've, I've probably stimulated questions, even pissed you off. So, qu ask me questions. Here I am in my home state. In the back first. Go. Uh, the epitaph of uh, Robert Frost's headstone, how did he arrive at that? Uh, on the epigraph, and it said, I, I have a lover's quarrel with the world? Well, that's a line from one of his poems, right? I've had a lover's quarrel with the world. Uh, it's funny, somebody sent me an email last week saying, what did Frost mean by a lover's quarrel? Well, what the hell do you think he meant? If you ever quarrel with your lover, you are both uh, testy and horrible and mean and ferocious, but loving and affectionate, and you know it's going to come out right, out right in the end, right? We quote quarrel with our lovers all the time, and Frost definitely quarreled with the world, right? He was both skeptic and non-skeptic. His father, Will Prescott Frost, was a Harvard graduate, and he was a tough-minded newspaper reporter, like my son's partner, Elsie. Really tough-minded. And uh, although unlike her, Frost's father was really tough. And he had it at the San Francisco News in, 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 in California, where, he, where Frost was raised. People forget that Frost was born and raised in San Francisco. He kept a, a revolver in his drawer of his desk. And on the desk itself, he kept a jar of formaldehyde which he had in it suspended a pair of bull's testicles. <laughs> and that kept people in the newsroom on their toes. <laughs> Yet his mother, so he had this hard-nosed, skeptical father, Will, Moody Fro Will Frost, but his mother was a Scottish woman, Isabel Moody, and she was uh, a devout Swedenborgian. And she was a mystic, and she believed in the mystical sense of nature. Uh, so Frost was always balancing the two. And I think his poetry is great because it blends 
the mystical side of his mother, the skeptical side of his father? Good question. That's the lover's quarrel. Yes. You speak very sympathetically about women. And I speak sympathetically about I women. I think so. And I mean, you yeah. talk about Lizzie, and you got into Sophia's line, and you're writing about uh, Tolstoy. And yeah. Yet all of your biographies are about men. Mm -hmm. I, you should write one about a woman. Do you have well, any? Well, I time? should. I should do a biography of a woman. Yes. Who would you have ever thought about it? You know, you, can, you only have so much time in life. I never planned to do a biography of John Steinbeck. Uh, that just came at me. Froth is a lifelong obsession. William Faulkner was just a curiosity that I did for a period. Yeah, I mean, I wish I, I, I thought of it. I had a lot of that doing that. I don't know, though. Wish I could. No, no, you should. Life is short. How do you choose between historical fiction and biography when you have this character who are so close with Frost and you said to write a historical novel, you really, you know, your mind can go wild. You can really get into those yeah. corners. Why did you choose a biography, and how do you how do you make that decision? Well, I, I kind of wish I knew how I made that, that decision. Why did I write, say, a biography of Frost, not a novel about Frost? Or why did I choose to write a novel about Herman Melville, not a biography? So a little bit. I mean, there is a kind of a gut feeling of how you can get at it. And since I don't make a lot of distinction except slight surface generic things, um, I, I just felt with Melville, you know, there's, there's a, a two-volume, two 2,000 page biography of Herman Melville. It has everything in those covers except Herman Melville. <laughs> right? It is so dull. And uh, likewise with William Faulkner. Uh, my friend Joseph Blotner wrote a 2,500 page biography of William Faulkner. And it is completely unreadable. You know, you would die rather than get through read that book. So it's just yes. Well, I really like your perspective on shaping a story and a narrative. Mm -hmm. There's a Polish writer I'd like to read named Richard Kubosinski. Oh, Kubo, uh, he was a journalist. Journalist. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, not, uh, biography came out the last couple of years criticizing him because he made some things up, particularly did something on Holly Selassie, but. His writing is fantastic. Literary journalism, they call it. Yeah. And he would file press reports for the Polish News Service from Africa and places in the West, but then he would do this other shaping, yeah. which is magnificent to read. Right. You know, I think um, I, I'm with him all the way, but what I do is I always label my stuff. And so if I'm, if I'm making a novel, it's fiction, and I want to really have the imagination to run free, and riot, I call it a novel. And if I say to myself, I'll give myself uh, a certain kind of restriction, and I'll keep to the conventions of, of either journalism or scholarship, I'll call it a biography. So I keep the distinction going. He just, uh, I, don't, I don't do the kind of literary journalism that he did, or else I'd be up, I'd be up the crick. Yeah. Is it hard, as a reader, um, a lot of times I like to read the word historical fiction, or the genre historical fiction. Um, and I wonder if there's any kind of standardization when you say you like to call it one thing, or if you want freedom, you call it another. Among writers, um, sometimes when you're reading a historical fiction, it'll say all the facts that are listed as facts are true, because I want to sort of use this educational and enrichment process. And then others, and I'll be done in a second here, the okay, others yeah. that are on the shelf in your bookstore or whatever that are called nonfiction, read so enjoyably that you wonder if in fact they are like the professor and the madman right. or swerve or something like yeah. that. They're clearly billed as nonfiction. Where does the... Well, they're clearly billed as nonfiction, but the material is shaped and yeah. given a dramatic form which, believe me, in real life it didn't have. So there, it's shaped, right? But it's called? It's called nonfiction in the case there. Now, um, I can't make <laughs> well, the, I, I simply say, I think that people are hung up on these categories. And I would simply say there's narrative, and there's you know, maybe books of fact. Don't try for narrative in telling a story. So I think if you're trying for a narrative, and then you're, I mean, we do have these conventions in English. Uh, in many ways, I've always been 
stymied by the fact that there is this thing in libraries, say, historical fiction. And there's a lot of tacky historical fiction, you know, stuff set in, you know, re in the Regency era, right? You know what I'm talking about? Georgette Heyer, these, you know, Bodus Rippers and so forth. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole th different thing, and I don't mess with that. I don't even read that stuff, right? Whereas, you know, um, you, know, you know, most anything that's processed by memory is fiction. And so very few novels are not processed material processed by memories, right? How many novels do you pick up that are, say, about the 60s or the 70s? Or even if it, they're about the 2000s, they're, they're, it's really set in the past. If it's one minute in the past, it's historical fiction, right? One minute. Only novels about the future are not historical fiction. So, yeah, please. Other languages, French, German, or in the Middle East or anywhere, of the kind of historical fiction, <coughs> right? Is, that, is it done everywhere, or is it mainly in English literature? You know, if you were to read, say, German literature of the 18th century, you'd find a lot of serious novelists writing biographical novels of the kind that I write, interestingly enough. Um, the English, of course, with once Sir Walter Scott came on the scene in the late 18th century, he kind of invented a genre called historical fiction. And there are romanticized views of history, Rob Roy and so forth. Um, and, that's and, th and then in the 19th century, you have a lot of, oh, you know, romantic writers writing these uh, kind of, oh, rosy glasses, historical or, or, dr or goth slightly gothic historical novels. That's a whole other genre. Uh, so you get in the, in the 19th century the invention of genre, which then it becomes ossified in the 20th century, and you get all these categories, right? Uh, and I think serious novelists don't mess with the categories. Um, any really original work of any kind breaks all boundaries and moves in its own direction and pays no attention to genre. That's my view. Yeah researched uh, so many different people and their personalities. If in real time you could meet one of these people for an hour and have a conversation, who would you pick and why? Most of the people I've written about have been such monsters. <laughs> I would really rather not meet Robert Frost. He would have been such an ornery fellow, right? You know, Frost was so jealous of everybody. I mean, horrible. I mean, there he was at Breadloaf in 1938. And Archibald MacLeish came to give a reading at Breadloaf. And Frost took a seat in the front row. And he left the seat next to him empty. And he had his New York Times with him. And everybody fills the auditorium. And MacLeish starts reading his rather pompous, stupid poems, as Frost knew they were. And he starts crumpling his pages of the New York Times loudly. And he builds a pyramid of the New York Times on the seat next to him. And when MacLeish gets to his most famous poem called Ars Poetica, Frost took out his match and lit the fire. And then he yelled in a loud voice, fire! And everybody ran from the building. So Frost was outside afterward thinking this was very funny. And Archibald MacLeish came up to him and he said, uh, Robert, you're a very good poet, but you're a very bad man. And Frost said, Archie, with you, it's the other way around. <laughs> so Frost was a pain in the ass. Uh, you know, yeah, all these guys were. I don't want to meet any of them. It's going to be hard enough in heaven, all these people at my table. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he had a very close relationship with Edward Thomas. And he ended the road not taken, which people tend to superficialize too much. And not understand it, but I understand Edward Thomas wasn't necessarily pleased because he thought Frost was pokey, fun. Yeah, yeah. Because, because Edward Thomas could never make up his mind about anything. Yeah. Except going. Except to war. Really finally made up the decision to go to World War One, where he was almost immediately killed. Yeah. And okay. Frost told him not to go. Who was Edward Thomas? Help me out. Oh, Edward Thomas was a, was a truly great young English poet who was killed in World War One and was Frost's only real friend, right? And Frost wrote, you know, The Road Not Taken, to, as, a, as a joke, to Edward Thomas, right? Before he died? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. just before he died. He died in 1917. 
Yes. Good. There should be a lot of concerns. Well, I kind of disagree with you. I think, uh, let me back up. I think what you're saying when you say shape, in my mind, I say interpretation. Um, I have studied a lot of theology, and theology is the human study of the divine, whatever. Okay. So it's always shaped by our prejudices and our perceptions because we're finite. So theology, literature, whatever kind of art is, everything is interpretation. But the scholarly side of it is that you try to, hmm, you try to have as accurate a base to start from as you can. Mm -hmm. um, You're talking about this thing called the agreed upon facts. Yes, well, right. kind of, sort of, because consensus history is, is also debatable. But like, I'll give you an example. I think it was Monday I saw a review in the Times of a new novel that's coming out about Robert Lowell and Flannery O'Connor. They had a, a kind of an epistolary romance. They never actually met. Right. So the novelist is now making them have an affair. There's an element there, I consider that falsification, not just imagination. There's, a, there's, there's respect for the people and respect for the lives they live that's involved in some of this. So I don't completely agree with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, presumably this says the person calls it a novel says this is a fantasy and, and in fact I would I would want to give a little preface or afterwards saying they never actually met yet let's imagine what it would be like if they did meet and you know I could see you having a fantasy about that I mean that's all it is right I mean I do have an afterword in to every one of my novels uh, that are historically gr grounded saying that I never vary from the agreed upon facts if I say that Herman Melville sailed on the SS, you know, for, for myth, to London in 1842, he did. And if he arrived in Liverpool on that year, he did. Uh, and in Tolstoy, I made a big point that every single fact is accurate. The children are his children. When they were born, that's when they were born. Uh, you know, when he, if he traveled up to Moscow to attend a trial, which he did, he did do that in that year. So uh, those are called the agreed upon facts. But how you select them and, and write about them and interpret them, you're right. Hermeneutics, right? That's a big, big philosophical word here, interpretation. And, uh, and, and, and there's no more greater area of interpretation than in theology, right? I mean, when you get down to theology, the life of Christ, whew, you're, you're into wild territory very quickly. Anybody else want to? Yes. Have you ever written your own conversations with Gore Vidal down? Have you ever written any kind of a memoir of those evenings? Because he just seemed to be fascinating, and whenever he was on a talk show, yeah. he was mesmerizing. So I, yeah, you know, I've written, to, I have written endless sort of reflections on my friendship with Gore Vidal. When Gore died, I wrote about five of them. Okay. So I have written a lot of them, and I'm doing Gore's biography. Wow. I'm his official biographer. Okay, cool. So I am doing Gore's actual biography. Yeah. So did you see in the, uh, the Week magazine by any chance the little blip on Gore? Did you pass away? What, what did it say? Spoke about Buckley wanting to punch him in the face. Mm -hmm. All of him Buckley. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they, they hated each other. Uh, you know, they, 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 they once debated each other on ABC News during the 1968 presidential conventions, right? And uh, they had uh, almost came to fisticuffs, right? They, and, and they really disliked each other. I mean, Gore, Gore had lots of, you know, he fought with Norman Mailer, horribly with Norman Mailer once. I, I used to, you know, I was, I was at many a dinner party with Gore and Norman Mailer, and it was pretty withering. Once uh, at a party, Mailer came in, and Gore was surrounded by journalists. And uh, Mailer came in and was looking rather jealous that Gore was getting so much attention. And he came up to Gore, and he punched him right in the mouth. And Gore, whew, back like this, he took out a handkerchief and daubed his lip and there was blood on the handkerchief and he said, Norman, once again, words have failed you. <laughs> I was once with him with Susan Sontag and she said, Gore, have you read my novel set in Naples? He said, yes, Susan, and please promise me you will never write another novel. I mean, he could be withering. 
a last question, and we'll call it a night. Yes, here. Do you uh, have any favorite contemporary authors that you'd like to share with us? Somebody, you know, well, you know, I'm just now really enjoying Ian McEwan's new novel, um, Sweet Tooth. Um, I mean, there are so many wonderful contemporary writers, but, you know, and I try to keep up, keep up with contemporary writing. You know, I read a range of things. You know, I read historical works, I read theology, I read uh, fiction, so forth. I'm always reading, reading something. So I try to move back and forth between, say, cl in fiction, between classics. You know, George Eliot or Thomas Mann, and um, more contemporary works like, you know, uh, Margaret Atwood or Ian McEwen or, or uh, lots of people, you know. I even read, I like to read certain, uh, I'm very friendly with uh, Ken Follett, he's a good buddy of mine, so I read all his books. One more question before we go, I could do one more. Yes. Well, does, I have a Robert Frost story. A Robert Frost question. <laughs> I'll do Robert Frost well, I know, when the cows I, come I, home. My roommate, I went to Norwich in the 60s, my yeah. roommate was from Middlebury. Yeah. And he, his dad owned a dry cleaner in Middlebury and he brought Frost his laundry. He went fishing with him once, but he did tell me, he says he's just a horrible guy. He's a cranky, cranky, cranky. And I, you know, in the 60s, you know, he, Kennedy made Frost, popularized Frost yeah. in the inauguration. So you think, oh, Robert Frost. So very early on, I got this image of Robert Frost that was That's contrary right. to what yeah. the popular myth. Well, if you read my biography, it's all there. I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for listening to me. Okay. <laughs>